In the third lecture of this series on tensor analysis, we had met our first higher rank tensor, the metric tensor. This was higher rank in the sense that this was the first tensor of rank higher than one that we had met, that is the first tensor beyond the more familiar scalars and vectors and also the slightly less familiar covectors. We had met the metric tensor there primarily as a bunch of n square numbers which combined with two vector components to produce what is called an inner product, an invariant scalar which you form by multiplying vector components and these coefficients together and adding up, that is forming the sum g i j a i b j. Now, from the fact that g i j a i b j is a scalar and the fact that a and b have well-defined transformation rules, we could figure out how g i j transforms. And that gave us our first inkling of a tensor transformation rule of a more complicated kind beyond just a vector or covector transformation rule. In today's lecture, we are going to take a look at tensors a bit more formally. That is, just like we defined vectors first by looking at a prototype, the coordinates, or rather, the coordinate differentials, and figuring out how they transform, and covectors too, by looking at another prototype, the gradient of a scalar, here we will form prototypes for different kinds of tensors by taking what are called outer products of a suitable number of vectors and covectors. And that will tell us what kind of transformation rule a general higher rank tensor would have. Once we have the definitions in place, we are also going to take a look at a few of the properties of tensors. We will in particular look at how to combine tensors linearly to produce new tensors and also how to combine them in the form of an outer product to form higher rank tensors. We will also see how you could reduce the rank of a tensor by a process called contraction. All of these are going to be very very useful in practical applications later on. But before we go there, let us quickly recapitulate what we had done in the last lecture. In the previous lecture, we had met the metric tensor, which was our first example of what this course is all about, tensors. Well, that's not really perfectly accurate, because as I have been stressing over and over again, stuff that we have seen all along, scalars and vectors, are actually tensors of rank 0 and rank 1 respectively, which means these things, things we have already known from high school days, are actually examples of tensors. But the metric tensor, the one which we met in the last lecture, is our first example of a non-trivial tensor, a tensor beyond scalars and vectors. And as we said, this really is a tensor of rank 0, 2. Actually, strictly speaking, I should say vectors are tensors of rank 1, 0. And before we met the metric tensor, we met another kind of object, which is also a tensor of a different rank, the covector, which was of rank 0, 1. Now, we have already talked about the transformation laws which define these objects. So let me just quickly recapitulate this. Scalars are things which simply don't transform. They are described by one single number, no indices. And when you go over to a new coordinate system, that is a coordinate system given by x goes to x prime, x prime i is s i k x k, a simply goes over to a prime equals a. No change whatsoever. So, this stays the same, no indices, and no factor of the coordinate transformation matrix to pick up, which sort of goes very well with 
rank 0. In addition to linear transformations which we are describing here, we also talked about the possibility that you could have a non-linear general coordinate transformation. And we did say that under such a transformation, what happens is coordinate differentials actually transform linearly with the coefficients del x prime i del x j multiplying the coordinate differentials dx j. Of course, there's a sum over j implied. So basically, s i k, which is a coefficient of x k in x prime i, gets replaced here for coordinate differentials by this quantity del x prime i del x k. So that is our basic dictionary. That's what we use when we transform according to general coordinate transformations, not just linear ones. And as I have stressed over and over again, the linear transformation also fits into this description because if x prime i is this i k del x k, then del x prime i del x k will of course come out to be the coefficient this i k itself. And let me stress once again, the basic difference for the general coordinate transformation simply is that these coefficients change from point to point Whereas here, the SIKs are constants for all positions. Now, having said this, let us just quickly recapitulate what we have learned about vectors, covectors, and the 0 2 tensor via the metric. And let me just make some space here. Let's just erase this part and talk about what happens to vectors. Vectors consist of m components, that is the number of dimensions of your space, and the components essentially transform in this manner. vi goes over to v prime i, where v prime 1, v prime 2, v prime 3 are the new components, and they transform in exactly the same way the coordinates do, so v prime i is s i j v j. Let me just point out once again that the j index here is dummy, so whether I call it k or j does not really matter. Now, we have also seen this, that for general coordinate transformations, v prime i, once again, v is exactly like, well, not like coordinates, but like coordinate differentials, so you get del x prime i del x j v j. The rule, once again, is simple. Wherever you have dx, replace it by v. Wherever you have dx prime, replace it by v prime. Oops, I find that I have made a small mistake here. You must remember that we decided to write coordinates as well as vector components with their indices as superfixes. So this really should have read x upper 1 up to x upper n. That is what we are consistently following throughout. Now, after I have collected that, let us take a look at covectors. Let's make a bit of a space here for what I want to say now. Let me remind you that our Sij matrix elements are actually elements, the ijth element of S the coordinate transformation matrix. At the same time, we introduced S lower i upper j elements, which were actually the ijth element of S transpose inverse. Which essentially is what transforms covector components. So for covectors, the transformation rule turns out to be omega i is the ith component of the covector omega, then omega i will go under a linear transformation to omega prime i and that will be equal to s lower i upper j omega j. At the same time, 
for a general coordinate transformation, omega prime i is related to the original omegas by del, del x prime i of del x j omega j. As we have already stressed in an earlier lecture, del x j del x prime i is actually the i j element of capital J transpose inverse, where capital J is the Jacobian matrix whose elements are del x prime i del x j. So, basically, the situation is completely consistent between the general linear transformation here and the general transformation here. Now for the matrix tensor, which is a rank 2 tensor, we had worked out that first of all, each of its elements are indicated by two indices. So basically it's g i j going over to g prime i j. Since each of the i and j indices can take n values, a matrix tensor of rank 2 has n square elements and we worked out in the last lecture that the transformation rule which governs them essentially looks like this. So basically like two copies of a covector. And you should be able to guess that the transformation rule for a metric tensor under any general coordinate transformation would simply read like this. g prime i j should be del x k del x prime i del x l del x prime j g k l which is exactly the general coordinate version of this transformation rule. So it is as if you are repeating the covector transformation rule twice. Twice as many indices, twice as many factors. That of course is why we call this a second rank tensor. In fact, it should be pretty easy to understand that every second rank tensor, or rather every rank tensor of rank 0, 2, let's call that tensor T and its elements by two indices like T, I, J, under the transformation of coordinates should go over to S I K S J L T K L in the case of general linear transformations or the equation which works for all transformations is del x k del x prime i del x l del x prime j of T K L. Indeed, we can even take this to be the definition of a 0, 2 tensor, something which used to be called earlier as second rank covariant tensors. Well, you should also be able to guess at this stage what a second rank contravariant tensor would transform like. Well, that is our 2, 0 tensor, which we did not talk about so far. But we can guess on the basis of what we are seeing so far that the transformation rule should really be something like this. First of all, we would like to indicate that there is a different kind of object by placing the indices differently. Here both indices go upstairs and Tij transforms to T prime Ij and now you essentially get the vector transformation coefficients twice. So you get Sik upper i lower k S J L T K L and there should be no prizes for guessing what the general coordinate transformation version of this should be. There should be del x prime i del x k del x prime j del x l t k l. I'm pretty sure you have already caught on to this by now. But just to stress this, we have this upstairs downstairs rule while imposing summation convention 
And that actually works out fine here as long as you decide to treat a k index in the denominator, so to speak, or rather k index in del del xk as a downstairs index. So an upstairs index in the denominator essentially behaves like a downstairs index. Well, you all know that this is really not a denominator, but you will excuse me for using that language just to illustrate the upstairs downstairs rule here. And if you have a 0, 0,2 and a 2, 0 tensor, why can't you have a 1, 1 tensor? Something which would be called a mixed tensor of rank 2. So now it will have indices written upstairs and downstairs. M square elements once again, because you do have two indices. The transformation rule, as you can easily guess, should be something like this. The upper i index will cause to a transformation coefficient to s i k like this, whereas the lower j index will carry with it a transformation coefficient, which is a covector transformation coefficient, s lower j upper l t k l. And it's general coordinate transformation version, del x prime i del x k, del x l del x prime j, t k l. Well, now that we have already written down all these transformation rules, it should be pretty easy to guess what the transformation rule would be for a general tensor of rank P, Q. So first of all, it should have P upper indices and Q lower indices. Basically, an element should be written like this, I1, I2, Ip, then J1, J2, Jq, and the prime version of this should be related to the unprimed version simply by something like this. Si1, K1, Si2, K2, all these are the vector transformation coefficients, upper i, lower k, Sip, Kp, that's a bunch of coefficients, but you should have along with this coefficients corresponding to the lower indices. So Sj1, L1, Sj2, L2, Q such coefficients, Sj, Q, L, Q being the last one of them, times T, K1, K2, dot, 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 Kp. Well, I hardly have much space to write the whole thing in, but I will try to squeeze it. I should really write this after the kp, but I don't have space, so I will just make do j2. So l1 l2 all the way lq. Strictly speaking, what I really should do is Put this whole thing a bit so that this is what it ends up looking like. And well, no prizes really for guessing the form for a general coordinate transformation. You will replace all the Si1, K1, Si2, K2 terms, the vector transformation coefficients by terms like del x prime I1, del x k1, del x prime i2, del x k2, and so on, and replace the s j1, l1, s j2, l2, the covector coefficients by del x l1, del x prime j1, del x l2, del x prime j2, and so on. And that will allow you to write down the coordinate transformation rule for a general p, q tensor. Of course, here, because of the fact that this has total of p plus q indices, the total number of components that p plus q tensor is described by happens to be n to the power p plus q, which can tend to become very large even for reasonable values of p and q. 
and here what we are really saying is once you do a coordinate transformation all the n to the p plus q terms change according to a rule given by this where all the elements are essentially jumbled up together by weighting them with p vector transformation coefficients and q covector transformation coefficients and this is how you would define a rank p comma q tensor in the older phases version let me now try to give you a slightly more systematic introduction to the concept of higher rank tensors phases style you might say that we have already seen all there is to see about higher rank tensors at least the definition so why continue this any further one point that could very well have come to your mind is it's fine to say that a tensor of rank p comma q is a bunch of n to the power p plus q components which transform in a particular manner when you change your coordinate system. However, do such things really exist? If they do, do we have examples? Of course, the 0, 0,2 tensor does exist. At least one example of that does exist, as we have seen, the metric tensor. Uh, we know that sp specifically for rotations, Gij is simply delta Ij. And for Lorentz transformations, G mu nu turns out to be eta mu nu. And these are both metric tensors and they also happen to be numerically invariant metric tensors. That is, their components are the same in all frames which are connected by rotations or Lorentz transformations respectively. But what about more general P, Q tensors? Now, in order to see that, let me try to formally show you kind of object which transforms like a higher rank tensor. For this, we will start from the basic concept of vectors and how they transform and try to create new objects out of vectors which transform differently. And the first thing that we are going to take a look at is the outer product of two vectors. is denoted with a O time symbol, a cross within a circle placed between the labels for two vectors. A O times B is what we are talking about here. This is an object which you create out of two vectors A and B. And basically what you are saying here is that this object has n square components, two indices i and j. And the ijth component of A O times B or the direct product of A and B is simply the product A i times B j. So basically you have a bunch of components, A1, B1 is one of them, that's a 1, 1 component, A1, B2, A1, B3 up to A1, Bn, then you have A2, B1, A2, B2 up to A2, Bn, all the way down to An times Bn. But first a trivial point, we have already seen that under general coordinate transformations, the quantity Ai, Bi does not make sense. It makes sense in one particular frame but it does not have a frame independent existence. But if AI BI does not make sense, how come AI BJ does? Note that what we mean when we say AI BI is not the individual terms in the sum, but the sum itself. So if you are given A1 B1 plus A2 B2 right up to AN BN in any one frame, the question is can you find out its value in another frame? And the answer for a general coordinate transformation is no, you can't. Which is why AI BI does not make sense, at least does not make frame independent sense. On the other hand, when you say AI BJ, what you really mean is not one number, but a bunch of n square numbers, the n square components, in which i and j of course take independently values from 1 to n. And if you know each and every one of these n square numbers, you will be able to find out their corresponding values of each of these n square numbers again in a new frame. So that is what is meant when you say that the direct product or this something which we just denote by AIBJ does have a frame independent existence. And so it's a well-defined object.
The question now, of course, is how does this transform? But first, a trivial point. We have already seen that under general coordinate transformations, the quantity ai bi does not make sense. It makes sense in one particular frame, but it does not have a frame independent existence. But if ai bi does not make sense, how come ai bj does? Note that what we mean when we say ai bi is not the individual terms in the sum, but the sum itself. So if you are given a1 b1 plus a2 b2 right up to an bn in any one frame, the question is can you find out its value in another frame? And the answer for the general coordinate transformation is no, you can't. Which is why ai bi does not make sense, at least does not make frame independent sense. On the other hand, when you say ai bj, what you really mean is not one number, but a bunch of n square numbers, the n square components, in which i and j of course take independently values from 1 to n. And if you know each and every one of these n square numbers, you will be able to find out their corresponding values of each of these n square numbers again in a new frame. So that is what is meant when you say that the direct product or this something which we just denote by AIBJ does have a frame independent existence. And so it's a very defined object. The question now, of course, is how does this transform? Indeed, in a traditional treatment of tensors, once again, the physicist version, you would actually define a 2, 0 tensor by using the outer product of two vectors as a prototype. So a tensor of rank 2, 0 something whose old name used to be contravariant tensor of rank 2, a name which is still very much in use nowadays, though a bit out of fashion, is an object described by n square components. So, the object has two indices i and j, each of which take exactly n values independently of each other. And so you have n square different possible components of this and the transformation rule is simply T prime ij is del x prime i del x p del x prime j del x q t p q. So the transformation involves two coefficients from the vector transformation rule. Of course, this is the general coordinate transformation version of the tensor definition. If you wanted specifically the situation for linear coordinate transformation, all you would have to do is realize that for a linear coordinate transformation, del x prime i del x p is nothing but s upper i lower p, the corresponding coefficient. So t prime ij would be s upper i lower p, s upper j lower q, t p q. And specifically for Lorentz transformations, x prime mu equals lambda mu nu x nu. This would become t prime mu nu equals lambda mu rho, lambda nu sigma, t rho sigma. And for rotations, where x prime i is r i j x j, and let me remind you once again, there are no upstairs or downstairs indices here because under orthogonal transformations, the distinctions between vector and covector simply does not exist. You write all indices downstairs, and for a second rank tensor, t prime i j is r i p r j q t p q. Let me just stress once again. There is no concept of a contravariant or a covariant tensor of rank 2 or any rank whatsoever. When you are dealing with rotations, there is only one kind of tensor for every rank. Now with this prototype at hand, it should be pretty easy to figure out what other kinds of tensors would be like. For example, if you want a 0, 2 tensor, the basic prototype of that would be the outer product of two covectors. So, an object which again will have n square components labeled by two indices i and j and the ijth component of this will simply be a i b j with lower indices on both. This transforms to a prime i b prime j which from the standard covector transformation rule is simply s lower i upper k a k s lower j upper l b l and thus the transformation rule simply becomes 
its lower i upper k its lower j upper l times the kth element of the outer product of these two covectors of course summed up over all k and l once again if you know the kth element for each pair k and l of this object in the new frame in the old frame you know it in the new frame and the transformation rule has two factors once again but this time two covector transformation factors so by modeling on this a general 0,2 tensor under a linear transformation could simply be something which mimics this so t lower ij again a bunch of m square components which will transform under a coordinate transformation to t prime ij given by s lower i upper k times s lower j upper l times t k l of course summed summed over k and l as a notation indicates looking at specific examples well it does not make much sense to talk about covariant tensors of rank 2 or tensors of rank 0,2 under rotations simply because there is only one kind of tensor of rank 2 under rotations and we have already met that for lorentz transformations on the other hand under the coordinate transformation x mu goes over to x prime mu equals lambda mu nu x nu the covector transformation equation essentially is a prime lower mu is lambda lower mu upper nu a nu and this lambda up lower mu upper nu are essentially mu nu th elements of the matrix l transpose inverse and it is these lower mu upper nu coefficients which go in the transformation for a covariant tensor of rank 2 and let me remind you once again in the last lecture we saw that we could obtain these new kind of coefficients from the old kind simply by lowering or raising indices using the eta and eta inverse respectively so with these coefficients in hand the transformation equation for a tensor of kind 0,2 or covariant tensor of rank 2 is simply t prime lower mu nu is lambda lower mu upper rho lambda lower nu upper sigma t rho sigma what about a general coordinate transformation well we have already seen this in the last lecture that under a coordinate transformation where xi goes over to the function x prime i of x1 x2 up to xn the coordinate differentials dxi go over to dx prime i which is equal to del x prime i del x j dx j and so del x prime i del x j plays the role of s upper i lower j but just as coordinate differentials are prototypes of vectors and the coefficients which tell you how coordinate differentials transform are the same coefficients which tell you how vectors transform the prototype for covectors happens with the gradient of a scalar and as we worked out before del i phi which by the way is shorthand for del phi del x i goes over to del prime i phi which using the standard chain rule of mathematics comes out to be del x j del x prime i del j phi so for a covector the coefficient s lower i upper j becomes for this general coordinate transformation the quantity del x j del x prime i and as we had already shown in the last lecture this really is the ijth element of the transpose inverse of the matrix formed by the coefficients which tell you how the coordinate differentials transform so everything is consistent and now how would a second rank covariant tensor or a 0,2 tensor transform under a general coordinate transformation all you have to do is replace the s lower i upper j by del x j del x prime i and hence the transformation rule becomes t lower i j goes over to t prime lower i j equal to del x k del x prime i del x l del x prime j t k l of course summed over k and l 
So this is what happens to a 0, 2 tensor under a general coordinate transformation. This of course is what happens to the metric tensor under a general coordinate transformation as well. That is, for a metric tensor g i j, the coefficients become g prime i j equals del x k del x prime i del x l del x prime j g k l. There is yet another kind of second rank tensor. It's called a mixed second rank tensor and it's also known as a 1 comma 1 tensor. And it should be pretty easy to guess that the prototype version of this is actually an outer product of a vector A and a covector B. So A O times B as before, but here what is being taken a direct product or outer product of is a vector and a covector. Now when we write indices on this object, we deliberately write an upper index i and a lower index j and this is defined to be equal to a upper i times b lower j. This is perfectly consistent with the placement of indices for vectors and covectors. Now what about the transformation rule for such a thing? Under the coordinate transformation a upper i simply becomes a prime upper i and b lower j becomes b prime lower j but that tells us exactly what the transformation rule will be because a prime i is s i k a k and b prime j is b j l sorry s j l b l so the transform version of a upper i b lower j is s upper i lower k s lower j upper l a upper k b lower l and this becomes the prototype of all two index objects that is objects with n square components which transform in this particular manner. So for a general 1 comma 1 tensor capital T the ijth component tij will transform to t prime ij which is given by s i k s j l t k l but what is very important is the s i k is s upper i lower k s j l is s lower j upper l one is a vector transformation factor the other is a covector transformation factor that's sort of obvious from the notation and for the general coordinate transformation case t prime i j becomes del x prime i del x k that is the way in which vectors transform times del x l del x prime j the covector transformation coefficient for a general coordinate transformation times t upper k lower l of course summed up over k and l. Once again I will urge you to take a look at the index placements and notice that once you think of a k in the so called denominator of the derivative and downstairs index then this upstairs downstairs rule for dummy indices is perfectly obeyed here. Also the other indices the free indices are consistent on both sides i is upstairs on both sides j is downstairs on both sides. Now there is one very important 1 comma 1 tensor which we all know and love is actually the quantity delta ij. Now it might sound strange to say that delta ij is actually a tensor because we have always known that as a symbol. What we really mean is if you did have a tensor, a 1 comma 1 tensor whose components in one frame is delta ij, so 1 if i and j are equal, 0 if i and j are not equal, then its component in any other coordinate system will also be delta ij. Verification is pretty quick. The transformed version of this, let's call this delta prime ij, will be according to our rule simply del x prime i del x k del x l del x prime j delta k l 
using the property of the delta symbol, you can do the sum over L trivially. And all this does is that it replaces every other L other than the one in the delta KL, that is, by a K. So you get del x prime i, del x k, del x k, del x prime j. This of course is a sum over k. And according to the standard chain rule of partial derivatives, this is nothing but the derivative del x prime i, del x prime j, which of course is delta i j. So this establishes the fact that if you have a 1 comma 1 tensor whose components equal delta i j in one frame, then its components are delta i j in any other frame. So, this is a numerically invariant second rank mixed tensor. I guess we have had enough practice in this by now to jump straight into the most general possible kind of tensor, a S, T tensor. As always, let us talk about the prototype for such tensors. First, the prototype of an S, T tensor is an outer product of S vectors and T covectors. The vectors here have been written down as A1, A2 and so on. I have written the index 1, 2 up to S in brackets. And similarly for B, I have also put in the indices and brackets just to indicate that they are indices which distinguish one vector from another, not components of a given vector. The I1, I2 up to Is and J1, J2, Jt are indices which talk about the components. And this particular I1, I2, dot, 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 Is, J1, J2, dot, 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 Jth component of the outer product is simply the product of the individual components of the vectors I1 at component of A1, I2 at component of A2, and so on, up to Jt at component of Bt. Now, under a coordinate transformation, each of these vectors and covectors transform, and the outer product transforms to A prime 1, outer product with A prime 2, and so on. So the I1, I2, dot, 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 Is, followed by J1, J2, dot, 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 Jt, lower indices, transforms to A1 primes I1 at component, A2 primes I2 at component, times all the way times Bt primes Jt at component. And from standard transformation rule for vectors, this becomes... S upper I1 lower K1 times A1's K1 component, S upper I2 lower K2 times A2's K2 component, all the way down to covector component S lower JT upper LT times BTS LTth component. That's actually easier to understand just by looking at it rather than to read out. So I hope my extensive description has not really switched you off. You should be able to figure out what is going on very easily. And by collecting all the coefficients together, what we see is that for the transformation of this outer product, you get S factors, S upper I1, K1, S upper I2, K2, etc., which come from the vector transformation coefficients and T factors, which come from covector transformation coefficients. S lower J1 upper L1, S lower J2 upper L2, and so on, right up to S lower JT upper LT. So, basically, this outer product has S upper indices and T lower indices. And when you transform a co your coordinate system, it picks up S plus T factors from transformation coefficients. S of them are vector transformation coefficients, T of them are covector transformation coefficients. And this helps us to define in general a tensor of rank S, T. It is an object which is described by n to the S plus T components, a total of S plus T indices, each of which can take n values. And the important thing is under the coordinate transformation, this transforms according to the rule T prime I1, I2, dot, 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 Is, lower J1, J2, dot, 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 Jt, is equal to S upper I1, lower K1, S upper I2, lower K2, all the way up to S upper Is, lower Ks. These are the vector transformation coefficients corresponding to the first S indices. 
and followed by covector transformation coefficients sj1 l1 sj2 l2 all the way up to sjt lt multiplied of course by t k1 k2 dot 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 ks l1 l2 dot 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 lt and obviously summed up over k1 k2 up to lt so this is the transformation rule which defines the tensor of rank s comma 2 of course this is the case for a general linear transformation for a general coordinate transformation all you have to do is replace the vector transformation coefficients s upper i1 k1 for example by del x prime i1 del x k1 uh, we have written p1 here instead of k1 but that's simply because that's a dummy so as long as you change both k1s in the previous expression to p1s things work out fine then you have del x prime i2 del x p2 that is s i2 p2 uh, along with this p2 index on t and so on these are so we get s such derivatives of x primes with respect to x these correspond to the vector transformation coefficients then we have t derivatives which come from the covector transformation rule and which essentially are derivatives of the old coordinates x in terms of new coordinates x prime so things like del x q1, del x prime j1, del x q2, del x prime j2, all the way up to del x qt, del x prime jt, paired obviously with lower indices q1, q2, qt on t. So this is how a general s comma t tensor is going to transform. So what we have done so far is define all possible tensors actually. Uh, in terms of the number of components they have, the number of indices you need to describe them, and more, more importantly, the way they transform under a coordinate transformation. This is exactly what we mean by a phases definition, or rather an older phases definition, of what a tensor is. Now that we have had a reasonably detailed discussion on the definition of tensors, let us take a look at their properties. And the first property that I want to mention to you is the one that you can see on your screen right now. A tensor is a vector. Now this might seem to be a typo or something I've just written down when I was still asleep because it definitely seems to be the case that we have mixed up the situation. We already know that a vector is a special example of a tensor. A vector is a 1 comma 0 tensor. By the way, a scalar is an object which has no indices and when it transforms, it does not really transform at all, it does not pick up any coefficient neither a vector or a covector coefficient so it's a 0 comma 0 tensor and covectors of course are 0 comma 1 tensors but what does it mean when we say a tensor is a vector a vector is a tensor is fine it's a special kind of tensor but does this statement at all mean anything the answer is it does, but there you have to understand that the word vector here is being used in the linear vector sense or linear vector space sense. So this vector is an element of a linear vector space. So if you remember your linear algebra, all we are really saying here is that we can linearly combine these objects, tensors, together to form new tensors. Now, there is a restriction here. You can linearly combine two tensors, say S and T, by multiplying them by two numbers, say alpha and beta, provided S and T, these two tensors, have the same rank. If they do, then this combination alpha s plus beta t is perfectly well defined and you can define them simply by telling us what its ij, kl etc. element is going to be. 
To illustrate how this works, let us take this specific example where S and T are both 2 comma 1 tensors. It should be pretty obvious from what we are going to say next is that this actually works for any situation where S and T are tensors of the same rank. But for the sake of definiteness, I am using a 2 comma 1 tensor S and another 2 comma 1 tensor T. Of course, that means that these tensors have two upstairs indices and one downstairs index and the combination alpha s plus beta t also should be a 2 comma 1 tensor at least that's what we are claiming so let's write this quantity u in terms of its components u upper ij lower k will be by definition alpha times s upper ij lower k plus beta times t upper ij lower k. So you basically form this linear combination u by linearly combining the two tensors element by element. This of course is the only natural way to do it. But the question really is does this combination law allow you to call these elements s, t, u etc vectors that is the, under this combination law do these elements taken together form a linear vector space? In order to qualify as a linear vector space, a system has to satisfy certain requirements. Now, most of these requirements are rather trivial to check, and I'm not going to go into the details of each and every step there. However, we do need to check one thing. Is this combination, U, at all a tensor of rank 2,1? And the way we have talked about this so far, what do we have to check to figure that out? We have to first of all check whether it has three indices. Of course it does. Two upstairs, one downstairs index, that's fine. The real check is how do these components transform? That is, what is u prime ij k? And the answer is simple. Once you are carrying out a coordinate transformation, the linear tra combination will now become a linear combination of alpha prime s prime ij k plus beta prime t prime ij k. Now alpha prime and beta prime are the values of the scalar in the new frame which of course are the same as alpha and beta. Scalars don't change but we do know that s prime ij k and t prime ij k will be related to the old components in a very specific manner. I have just written down the transformation rule for general coordinate transformations here because they of course encompass everything. But if you want, you can write down the argument specifically for linear transformations. It will work along the same lines. S prime ijk having two upstairs indices and one downstairs index will transform like the following. It will pick up two vector coefficients del x prime i del x p and del x prime j del x q, one covector coefficient del x r del x prime k and this of course multiplies s upper p q lower r there being a contraction or summation over p q and r. The exact same thing happens for t as well. t prime i j k is related to t p q r by exactly the same coefficients. As a result, we can simply take the bunch of coefficients common out and you get u prime i j k is del x prime i del x p del x prime j del x q del x r del x prime k times alpha s p q r plus beta t p q r and here the final thing in the bracket is simply u upper p q lower r. So this confirms for us that the components u upper ij lower k really do transform like 2 comma 1 tensors and as a result the very first test that we had in our claim that tensors are vectors have been passed. You can go through the other defining properties of linear vector spaces and check that under this particular definition tensors of the same rank do form a linear vector space. That check is rather trivial, but you should do it anyway. This, I hope, clarifies my rather funny tongue-in-cheek comment about the first property. 
tensors are really vectors. You can linearly combine them. But there is one very important catch which you have to bear in mind. For a general coordinate transformation, there is one simple thing that you have to be aware of. This kind of linear combination can be carried out only for tensors at a given point. You cannot linearly combine tensors at two different points because then the coefficients which they will pick up despite looking the same, the same combination of derivatives would still be different because you are evaluating them at different points. So tensors at different points cannot be linearly combined. This is a very important restriction and this will have a far-reaching role to play when we talk about curvature using the tensor language. A second important property that a tensor has is that of contraction. Once again, let me illustrate this with a specific example, that of a 2 comma 2 tensor. For contraction to work, you have to have a mixed tensor. The tensor has to have at least one upstairs and one downstairs index because the contraction essentially is going to be done over that. So basic idea is you start with T upper ij lower kl, that is a 2 comma 2 tensor. But from that construct this entity T upper ij lower jl. Of course, the moment you have replaced the k downstairs by a j, you actually imply that there is a sum over this repeated index. So j here is really a dummy index. So for there are only two free indices i and l. So this object has two free indices, one upstairs, one downstairs. So at least from the index positioning point of view, it looks like a 1 comma 1 tensor. Now, my claim is, if you were to do this to a 2 comma 2 tensor, you will really get a 1 comma 1 tensor. How do you check that? You check that simply by looking at the way in which this quantity transforms. Once you carry out a general coordinate transformation, T prime ij jl is going to be del x prime i del x p that's the transformation coefficient due to the index i then for j you have del x prime j del x q for the lower j you have del x r del x prime j and for the l you have del x s del x prime l times t upper p q lower r s summed up over p q r and s now what makes this different from the transformation rule for a 2 comma 2 tensor is simply that there is a repeated index j which is being summed over. So let's focus on those two terms which involve the index j. That's del x prime j del x q del x r del x prime j which according to a standard rule from uh, partial derivatives again is simply del x r del x q and that is simply delta r q. Now that you have got a delta symbol here, it is very, very easy to actually carry out the summation. The delta RQ in the middle of the sum essentially ensures that the Q summation can be done trivially or the R summation can be done trivially, any one of them. In this case, I have decided to carry out the R summation. Of course, what that does is replaces R's everywhere else by Q's. So you, what you get is del x prime i del x p which of course is a covariant, is a vector transformation coefficient due to the co index i and further coefficient del x s del x prime l which is the covector coefficient due to the index l followed by t p q q s. So note once again that what we have on this side is actually the contracted version of the tensor contraction being done over the index q. So basically if we write T i j j l as tau i l where i and l are just the free indices one upstairs one downstairs this relationship that we have just shown actually amounts to tau prime i l is del x prime i, del x p, del x s, 
del x prime l tau p s. So this really is the transformation rule for a 1 comma 1 tensor. So what happens under contraction? Contraction must occur between an upstairs index and a downstairs index. This of course is a strict rule that we follow as far as summation convention is concerned and the basic point is that is how you end up with a well-defined object which is with its own transformation rule. And what does contraction do to such a tensor? It lowers the rank. It actually reduces the contravariant or upstairs rank by 1 and the downstairs rank by 1. So contracting one pair of indices on a PQ tensor yields a P minus 1, Q minus 1 tensor. Of course, repeating the contraction, if possible once again, would give you a P minus 2, Q minus 2 tensor and so on. And one more important thing, which should be sort of obvious here, which is, instead of contracting over these two indices, as we have done, you could also have done this contraction basically getting rid of the first contravariant and the first covariant index or we could have done this contraction T i j k j or this contraction T i j K i. These will all give you four, 1 comma 1 tensors and essentially will give you different 1 comma 1 tensors starting from the same 2 comma 2 tensor. The general rule is contractions reduce both the upper index and lower index count by 1 so lowers the rank of the tensor. Now we have already seen that we can combine tensors of like rank together linearly to produce a tensor of the same rank. On the other hand, what we can do is combine tensors of different ranks together in an entirely different way by forming a product or so-called outer product. We have already seen outer products of vectors and covectors. Basically, the same idea works for tensors as well. And I have just illustrated this with a specific example. We have a 2 comma 2 tensor S and a 3 comma 1 tensor T using these two tensors, we can form the outer product S cross T or S O times T whose A, B, I, J, K upper index C, D, L lower index would, the term would be the product S, A, B, C, D times T, I, J, K, L. Five upstairs indices, three downstairs indices, a five comma three tensor. Well, just because you have the right count of indices does not make this a five comma three tensor. What you should actually check is that under the coordinate transformation, you do get five vector coefficients and three covector coefficients multiplying the thing. That is very, very easy to check. So I'm going to leave you this as a task. Well, I will leave you the general thing as a task. The outer product of a P comma Q tensor and an R comma S tensor is going to be a P plus R comma Q plus S tensor. It is very, very easy to show that this is the case. The converse of this is slightly more difficult and I am going to just leave this as a possible exercise for you. If the outer product of an entity which has P upstairs indices and Q downstairs indices, but we do not at this stage know whether it is a tensor or not, with a R, S tensor. So I know that S is something which has P upstairs indices and Q downstairs indices. I have another tensor, let's call it T, which is really a tensor, an R comma S tensor. So when we take the outer product by multiplying them component by component, we do get something with P plus R upstairs indices and Q plus S downstairs indices. Now if this something happens to be a P plus R comma Q plus S tensor, then what we can conclude is that the original thing is a P comma Q tensor. This in fact is pretty important because this is used very often in calculations to figure out the rank and nature of an object. Just having indices, as I said, 
in the right place does not really make something a tensor. You have to either show that it obeys the right transformation rule or sometimes it is just easier to show that if you carry out this kind of an outer product with a known tensor, the resulting thing is also a tensor. And that actually helps us to decide that what you started out with is a tensor. This is actually going to be very, very useful in practical calculations. At this stage, we have learned quite a lot about general higher rank tensors. However, as I've said before, this kind of definition of a tensor is not really very aesthetically pleasing. After all, what we are really saying is that a tensor is an object which exists independent of the coordinate system. And hence, if we know enough of its components to know it fully in one coordinate system, we should be able to find out all its components in a new coordinate system. In other words, we should have transformation rules for tensor components simply because tensors do exist out there in the real world and are not really tied down to a particular coordinate system. Having said that, this definition, which involves coordinates and what happens to components when you change coordinates, involves the coordinate system in a big, big way. It is really rather unsatisfactory to have to talk about something which is coordinate independent, essentially by using coordinates all the time. But can we define tensors without going into the notion of coordinates? The answer actually is that we can. Indeed, as I've said earlier in the very first lecture, Differential geometry gives us a way of defining tensors and all kinds of other objects without involving coordinates at a fundamental level. Now, we have been avoiding differential geometry in this course for good reason, because it will take quite a lot of time to actually pick up enough differential geometry to be able to get anything useful out of it. However, it so happens that the fundamental notion of a vector using differential geometry takes some amount of building up too. But once you have that in place, covectors and tensors of higher rank become very, very simple to talk about. In fact, this is what would be a very, very simple definition of a tensor, one which does not talk of transformation rules at all. We could define a P, Q tensor simply to be a multilinear map that maps P covectors and Q vectors to a number. So after all that I've said today, this is all a tensor really boils down to, a multilinear map. I'm pretty sure you will all find this definition a lot more concise and after a bit of practice, a lot easier to understand perhaps than the transformation law definitions that we have been giving so far. I'm not saying that the transformation law definitions are not important. They are, and they are very useful. However, it turns out that they will follow naturally from this definition once we understand this thoroughly. However, that is going to take some time to get to grips to. So let us leave that for the next lecture. So in the next lecture, we are going to take a look at tensors but this time, from the point of view of them being simple multilinear maps, which acts on covectors and vectors to give numbers. Until then, goodbye.